um, just out there struggling to copy something, to understanding relationships. It, um, and so you can go from a copier to a creator. Well, welcome to day number, let's see, what day is it? What day is it? It is day number 139, 139 days in a row, and we have been here live with you. I'm Eric Rhodes. Today's guest is Lynn Boyer. Say hello, Lynn. Hi, everybody. All right, so we're going to wait just a second for some people to come on, and I'm going to fill some time while they're joining us. So, Lynn... What are you going to talk about today? I am going to talk about the most important piece of art equipment on the planet. In fact, in the whole universe. The most important piece of art equipment on the planet. In fact, the whole universe. In fact, you must, be, you must be referring to the easel brush clip. Oh, man. Spoiler alert. Come on. You ruined it. I get something else out. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I love people, mine. You gave me one. See it? It's right there. Oh, I do see it. Yes. Yeah, no, you bought it. it. You bought it, right? You bought it. Yeah. No, I did give you one. Okay, so uh, Lynn Boyer is going to be our guest today, but first we're going to get to some announcements. So, Lynn, say goodbye for now, and we'll be back in a minute. Meet Lynn Boyer. Say okay. hi, Lynn. Hi. I let me get back to the screen. I was trying to fix the sound that wasn't my broken sound. <laughs> Ah. All right. Okay. Um, so, I'm almost back. There we go. All right. Okay. All right. Good. So welcome, Lynn Boyer. And uh, everybody, thumbs up and say hello to Lynn for coming on today and joining us. Uh, Lynn, tell us where you are. Where you're in? I'm in Durango, Colorado right now. In Durango. Lexington. Okay. Yep. And uh, so what are you going to talk about today? Well, I said in the preview, the most important um, tool in my toolbox, most important tool in the universe, I'm going to um, share that with you. I also have a thing called my my toy box, and I'm going to pull things out of there and um, show you um, some really fun exercises to do, and I'm happy to move the camera and show you around my studio a little bit later if you like. Oh, that'd be nice too. And we want we want you to show some of your work too. So we know that you're capable of teaching us. <laughs> oh, these are all just art prints I bought off the internet. Oh yeah. You bought them at Target. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I ran down there this morning. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You just filled up the studio with, yeah, with all these beautiful works. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Why don't you go ahead with, with the first part of your presentation? Let's see. It's, it's buffering. It's buffering. I, could you, I went away. You went away. Are we back? Well, I, I saw you the whole time, but you, uh, you may have felt like you were freezing up, and it may have something to do with your internet there. So we do have those issues from time to time. Yeah, I've, I've got pretty nifty internet, so, but uh, I, if it, we'll just... Um, it's like from the moon. You know, if your computer has a bunch of other stuff open, it might slow down your computer. Well, I think I was pretty good about that, but I will check. Mm, nope, we're all good. Well, we're we'll good. cross fingers. Every once in a while, I might go to the Okay. All right, let's let's give it a try. All right. I'm I will here. let I will let you know. This is this is live, folks. This is how how it really is. Not not like on TV. This is real life. Um, right. Would would uh, Lynn was on Realism Live, or excuse me, was on Plen Air Live with us. Lynn uh, came down to the studio. We were socially distanced. She and Susie Baker stayed at uh, at our house in our in the world famous artist cabin in the backyard, and. Uh, and we went to dinner a couple of times. We had a lot of fun. What was that experience like for you, the, the plein air live experience? Oh, it was it was so much fun. Um, I the, All of your crew and you guys were fabulous. The artist cabin was so nice. That was lovely of you. And um, to be able, especially during this time, to connect with everyone. Um, and even though it was through a camera, it was so nice just to be able to 
focus on what I was doing and thinking about everyone in the audience and share what I had to share. No, everything else was taken care of. I loved it. It was fun. Thanks for inviting me. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and and uh, why don't you go ahead and talk to me about some of the things that you were going to share. And okay. uh, we'll go ahead and get started on that. I'm Mikey. Okay. I'm turning my mic down in between because I've got this uh, okay. loud air conditioning and I'm trying to uh, cut the noise down. Okay, and you're buffering. I think you can uh, see me. I'm buffering. You might still be able to see me. Um, uh, we can. We can see you, and and once in a while you freeze up, but uh, go ahead, and we'll just, okay. we'll all be patient. Everybody, be patient, please. Thank you. <laughs> like I said, it's it's um, it's Wednesday morning, Durango, Colorado. <laughs> so, or yeah, it's morning here, ten. Okay, the most important piece of equipment in the universe that you all need. You actually have half of it already. Is this. <laughs> Why? Um, why does light hit an object that way? Why is color different uh, to, when it's next to something else? Um, why does that group of cows look like one really cool black shape? Um, what I have found is the most valuable thing in my toolbox is my curiosity, asking questions. In fact, um, a little trick I tell people, I don't know if you've ever um, wanted, I don't know, you want to paint a picture and you just go, I have no idea what to paint. There's my studio. There's a white light canvas. And, or go outside and look around and you, the whole world's out there, you don't know what to paint. Um, so what I do is I ask a question. Um, and, I actually never, I never start a painting unless I have a question I'm trying to answer. Um, even if it's a big studio painting for a show, I, I want to learn a new skill or ask a question. Um, I've been painting some really bright paintings and I walked in one day and went, I wonder if I can paint a really wonderful painting with just grays. And so that was my mission for the day. Um, and I find it's pretty, it's pretty foolproof and it, it gets you, it gets you off the dime and going again. And plus it's really instructive. Um, when I start pulling stuff out of my toy box here, um, you'll see that sometimes I won't start painting right away because I don't have the answer to my question yet. So I'll, I'll do, I'll do stuff like create, um, I don't know. I'll create charts uh, where, let's see, let's find some of my charts. I'll, I'll, I'll go, well, I'm, I'm using X number of palettes, so I'm going to see how they tint down. Or um, I do these, uh, my, my value sketches. I'll say, is this working in, in, in values? And these are all value sketches that I keep because I like them and they're fun to do. Uh, Lynn, will you sh will you show us a couple of those up close? Just hold them yeah. up to the camera. Just pick yeah, pick absolutely. a couple at random. Sure, absolutely. Um, in fact, I'll even tell you what they are because uh, people can find them on my website. Okay, this would be uh, a little one of um, the St. Francis Church down in Santa Fe. And I actually was going to set up, I didn't want to paint the tourist view, so I walked around the back and saw this beautiful thing happening where the shadow of the cross was hitting on the little door next to the rectory where the priest goes in. So I, I, um, I threw my pack on the ground, grabbed my little sketch box, and really quick did this. And when I have these, oh, this doesn't work too well. You can't see it when I shake them. Um, yeah, hold it still, please. <laughs> you can't, it makes it, you know, it says if I, you can't see any mistakes if I shake it. Um, so when I have these little sketches, um, I stick to them and, and the, the weather can change, the light can change, and I can still keep painting as long as I'm paying attention to those. Um, here's a little one, Moran Point at the Grand Canyon. So I'll always start with these to make sure it's a nice value pattern. Um, are you using uh, markers for those? What are you using? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's a little boat uh, I was doing. Yes, I use. Um, I carry my little um, sketch box here, and it's got my little four my little four by six pad, um, and I use double ended um, Prismacolor markers. I use. Um, sorry, I keep cutting my head off. Anyway, I use the chisel ones, the ones that have a chisel on one end and then a um, point on the other. Some people use the ones that have a brush on the end. Um, I prefer the chisel, and the reason why is because I don't want to start painting or drawing. The chisel, I can get everything I want with the chisel in, but it keeps me focused on the fact that I'm trying to create strong patterns. And, and by using the chisel, I'm creating graphic shapes. And so I, keep I understand that Prismacolor and some of the others uh, make sets where they have a series of grays and you can get a yeah. series of warm grays or cool grays. Are you using uh, warms and cools? No, I stick to one or the other. Um, it doesn't matter which. I'll, I'll sometimes buy a cool gray set if I find them or, or the warm grays, but I don't, I don't mix them. Because at that point, I'm not thinking orms and cools. And also, I want just a consistency of values. So I'm seeing just values, and I want them all kind of the same color. And then what I'll do is I'll pick um, like a 90, 70, 50. I skip one. So I'll pull those out. So I'll use maybe a black, a 90, let's see, 90, 70, 50, and maybe throw a 30 in. But I usually only use three of them plus the white of the paper. Um, cause I don't want to design all over the yeah. value scale. Right. Okay. So you're just, you're really looking for a pure value study. You're not trying to worry about warm or cool right now. Absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. I want to break it down and chunk it and be thinking about solving one problem at a time. And, right. um, then move on. When I start toning my canvas is when I start considering where I'm going to put the warms and cools. We, uh, we have a lot of people who are going to be watching this who are not necessarily familiar with some of the insider terms. Would you explain to people what toning a canvas is? Um, I will. Absolutely. Um, in fact, I wonder if I have one. Um, you have one on the easel behind you. Yeah. Um, well, here, I could, I could, this has, was toned, and, and I just used one brush to, um, and almost one pigment, two pigments, so you can actually see the toning. Um, I would take the pigment, and th this is, whoops, <laughs> this, all that you see, is, is the toned canvas showing through. I never, I never painted over it. I left the toning. And so um, all I'll do is take a little pigment of uh, the color family, whether it's warm or cool, that I want to put um, on the canvas, and I'll thin it way down with uh, some odorless mineral spirits and so a little bit of pigment. Now, that was super warm. That was... Um, if I wanted to cool that down, I would have put a little tiny touch of ultramarine blue in to cool it down a bit. And well, then that, I, was a bright, that was a bright sunny day. You're trying to say he's squinting and he's got the sun on his hat. You wanted it warm. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted it warm. Um, and so um, I would have used um, trans, a little bit of transparent oxide red with odorless mineral spirits. Not too much odorless mineral spirits, though, or it'll just turn into soup. You want the pigment to be able to stick a little bit. So um, you then take a paper towel and wipe the canvas, cover the canvas with a little bit of pigment, and, and then you basically wipe it off. And it's now what, nice, what, are the, what are the benefits of toning a canvas? Why, why do you tone a canvas? Well, what I find is um, it gives you a surface to work on. Even if the toning is really light, um, sometimes if there's a sky, I'll tone the top with a little just... Um, manganese or a little super light blue but what it does is it it makes sure that nowhere on that canvas is there that garish bright white um otherwise what will happen sometimes if you're uh, painting you'll get to the end of 
what you think is the end of your painting and you'll if you haven't covered every square inch of the canvas you'll have these little white dots that are distracting so it just takes care of that up front and it and it also um, helps inform uh, the painting a little bit the color of the light Eric you just pointed out that you know this was a bright sunny day uh, I wanted him to be squinting it's like he's you know in, in, in Laredo we're getting ready for a gunfight so I wanted it warm so it's not just random tinting um, I, I will caution people um, I know some people will if they're going to paint a cool painting they'll put an orange underpainting or a warm painting they'll put a cool blue pretty um, underneath because it gives a little, if there are spots, then it gives a little uh, vibration of the two colors, the complementary colors, um, which actually works. But if you don't paint, if you're gonna do that, you have to paint pretty opaquely um, or having that complementary underpainting is going to, um, it's gonna, the light's gonna bounce down, shine back through and actually neutralize. It's gonna gray your colors down maybe more than you want. So we have to uh, we have to assume that that uh, transparent paint is almost like stained glass. The light goes through it, bounces off the, the canvas, and then comes back. And so yeah. when it's bouncing through those colors, you're getting you're getting some of that not yeah, the effect you're not looking for if you do it wrong. Yes. Okay. You're mixing the cool. color. Okay, so I kind of interrupted your flow because I was asking about toning a canvas. Oh, no, that's fine. I I'm I'm up for anything. I got my stuff in my toy box and. If someone asks an interesting question, I'm happy to answer. Well, so. we'll do we'll do Q and A at the end, and so people can save up their questions, start putting them in the comments, and in the meantime, uh, right. let's keep going. All right. Um, so, what I wanted to, how I started you out with the most important thing: why? Always be asking why, 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 why this, why that. When I was a kid, uh, my, one of my nicknames was Question Box. I was just born with the why. So, um, I. I need to look at something and understand why that's happening. The advantage to that is um, if you understand what's happening with what you're looking at outside or in the studio, you will actually be able to see it better. The more you know, the more you'll be able to see. Our brain can only um, process things that it has a frame of reference for. So you will actually start seeing more if you understand the physics of how light hits something, bounces back, reflected light. Now remember, we have light source. We have the dome of the sky if we're outside. Um, and then we have maybe reflected light of green bouncing back into a white barn. So remember this, every object that light hits itself becomes a light source. So you have your primary light source, you have maybe a secondary light source of Let's say there was the moon, uh, there was a campfire, um, and then maybe some moonlight bouncing off some cliffs. So you have uh, the prior, uh, you can prioritize all these light sources and start imagining, you can start imagining um, the, the photons, the light rays, and think about it. Go, oh my gosh, I see the lights hitting that the local color of this red, so then I'm going to get some red light bouncing down into this green at the bottom of it, which is going to neutralize it, so it's going to be kind of a neutral shadow. And when you start, it's really fun, when you start figuring this out, um, you're going to see twice as much as maybe you've been seeing. And out of my toy box, um, what I do, if you get, if you don't have a um, box that you use for still lights or something, you can just get those, go to um, the office supply store and get the panels that kids use for like their science projects, you know, the things fold in the middle. I just got one, and or I got some, and cut them in thirds um, so that I could have these little mini setups uh, for, for students. Um, and I set these on a table, and then I have, if you go to the fabric store, you can get these, all these, a billion colors of all these little fabric scraps. And what I'll do is I'll hang them over the sides and then I'll, um, if I have a question about what's happening in the studio or outside, I'll go ahead and I'll get my little 
my little cones and um I got I just it's so much fun. So I guess I I never left elementary school, you know, I like to it's always the first one to run to get the thing. So, yeah, what they, I would, they probably should have not let you out of elementary school. Well, they I escaped. <laughs> they didn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, let's see if I can do this. All right. So, what I do is I demonstrate. I don't know if you can see. I'm trying to. Yeah, get, yeah, we could see it. Yeah. yeah how, how that blue is bouncing back into that white. And so, you can see those three planes. And as I turn that, that object, you can see that shadow, and as it, I turn it now, you're going to get the blue light bouncing into that side, and as I rotate it through the arc, you can see that it's now getting light from over there. So what I'll do is I'll have all different combinations of that where I'll, um, I'll, set, my little, I'll set my little box up. See, I'm trying to be the table. I'm trying to be the table. It's, not, it's, it's a little hard. Um, Mar Martha Stewart started out the same way. You see, okay, okay, I got hope. Um, so you just, you know, ask a question and then come back and set up a little experiment to go, okay, why was the side of that barn that color I was seeing? Um, and, and then what's really good is once you set up some of these experiments, go ahead and, and paint them. Um, I'm trying to find you a, a sample. Um, and what I do, here's a, here's a trick. I have lots of tricks. Um, is when you're doing little experimental things, I buy, by the hundred, little six by eight, the cheapest canvas boards with the crummiest surface that I can buy because it convinces my brain that I'm not... I'm not painting a picture. Um, I'm coming back. Don't worry. I know you're just seeing my back. I'm looking for something in my toy box. Yeah, I'll find it. Um, so anyway, it convinces your brain that you're not, uh, it's not going to be a painting. You're not going to sell it. There's no hope for it to be sold. And you can just freely experiment. Even though the surface is awful, who cares when it's, it's an experiment. So, um, Here's a great one. All right, you can try it. Now, I made these little these little cone or <laughs> cylinders. Um, you're right. They, I didn't graduate, did I? Um, I made these little cylinders, these little right. orange cylinders, and they're, they're something I wanted to prove to myself. Um, if you're making a cylinder and you want that um, shape to turn, you're going to mix the color on the dark side. You're going to mix the color on the light side. And then the tendency is if you keep blending it and you mix them together, you'll get the shape to turn. So let's see. I'm going to get this up here. What happens if you do that is you have the shadow side hue. You have the light side hue trying to get this so you can really see it. And then you mix them together to get where the shape turns. And then if you would blend those edges, you'd get a nice turn on the cylinder. Well, why that isn't completely successful in a lot of paintings that look not too lively or dead or not super realistic or don't have the ring of truth is because the way light works is this plane here, the middle plane, that is getting, um, that is not in the shadow, but also is not being affected by being blown out by the light over here, is going to be the truest to the local, co uh, the local color of the object. So Can it's tell, what people, tell people what local color is? Okay, local color would mean, um, that's a term for, you know, I point at an apple and I go, what color is the apple? And you go, it's red. So it's just a term saying, what color is it? The local color would be the color unaffected by if I was shining like a blue light on it, just a normal day. Um, so it would be red, green, blue. That would be local color. Um, so this was an orange cylinder and <laughs> I keep getting this backwards. Um, 
So what's gonna happen is where a shape turns out in nature, be it even a rock or something, right at that terminator between the shadow and the light is actually gonna be the most intense color. And so what happens is if you try to create it by blending the light uh, color and the, the color of the shadow, you're gonna get this sort of dull mess. So what you have to do is you have to um, go ahead and mix a third color, which is the, the um, intense uh, local color, sometimes intense, sometimes not. <laughs> this is backwards, when I move it? So it's not hurting my brain. Um, so anyway, so uh, when you mix it properly like this, you're going to get a much nicer effect when you're turning forms. So anyway, this was my experiment. Um, and you can see I write notes on it and I have notes to self, I'll write notes on the back because even though I suspect, okay, mix, what's that? Mix a separate color. Half tone, oops, <laughs> half tone is high chroma. So by, by working these things out yourself, and um, you'll never forget them, and it's super fun to do, and really improves your painting. Now, do you find that that, that, that that occurs whether you're in natural light outdoors or whether you're in indoor light, or is it considerably different? No, that's really um, how a form, a form works, because even indoors, you'll generally have a couple different light sources. Um, and yeah, so light light is light, no matter what the light source, whether it's a lamp in your living room, the sun in the sky, or or the headlight on a train coming at you really fast. There, there was a term that, uh, that was used in the old days. I think Ives Gamble used to teach this. I may be wrong about it. He called it the bed bug line. And I don't know why he came up with that term or whoever came up with it before him, but it is that line where where uh, light and shadow meet, and they always say that's the most chroma. And and a lot of artists will even put it in if they don't see it. For for instance, if you're painting the the shape of a face and the shadow side where the shadow meets the light side, that if you put a little bit of of chroma right there, it it reads well. It does. Yes, absolutely. Okay, are we done? You got more. Oh, I, I can I go on for days. Well, let's not go on for days, but let's go on for another oh, 15 minutes or so. All right. Um, I'll just show you a couple more. Um, again, just to demonstrate uh, exercises that I do all the time. You know, I'm working out form, shape, reflect the light off a shiny surface. And if if you... Um, start with the object like this and work your way up to a form that has turned, you'll find it's easier. Um, you'll see exercises where you can even take a, um, like peel a pear and, and then slice it so it has planes. You'll see behind me, let's see over here, my, <laughs> wow, this is backwards. Planes of the head over here, that's a little um, statue thing that is, you'll find commonly in art studios to understand how yeah. light hits planes of the head. Do you want me to go, go get it? Yeah, go get it. All right. Um, yeah, this is a really wonderful uh, and valuable tool to have in your studio, whether you're a figurative artist or not. Light is light, form is form. And um, Actually, you used to be able to get it in gray plastic. I had one years ago, and you can't anymore. But you can still, I believe, get it in these these plaster ones. Um, it's called Planes of the Head. I'm sure if you Google it, uh, you can get it. But you can see where, whether you're <clears throat> painting an object or a cow or a scene or whatever outside, um, you can see this Planes of the Head. First, you want to understand something in its simplicity. So you can see how they have taken the head and reduced it to simple planes. And then, as you understand that, in fact, you paint in this order too. You first, you first paint simple planes and shapes and their correct values, even if you're doing a landscape, no matter what it is. And only after you get a correctness to those and the value relationships, then, uh, no matter what it is you're painting, then you break those down 
to secondary planes. So you take each, each plane and break it down yet again. I like yours. Mine is gray. Yours is white. I kind of like the white. It really pronounces the the impact of color mm -hmm. because you can you can see the different shades of color that are hitting in the different planes as well. I have a lot of different lights up for this, and you actually can see, like, look right there, the different colors: the 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 blue, the red, right. and the yellow. Right. On the three different light sources. So this is actually a good demonstration of what we were talking about. Okay, let's keep moving. All right. Tick tock, All right. tick tock. All right, tick tock, tick tock. Um, nifty uh, color mixing card, five steps to color mixing. Um, I think it's on my website. I could also email you one if you want or email you a PDF. Okay, well, so let's let's just not gloss over that real quickly. Your website is lit. Oops, I misspelled oh. it. I got it. <laughs> Lib. Lib Boyer. Lib Boyer. Lynn, like that. That, that would be funny. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. so it's lynnboyer.com, L-Y-N-B-O-Y-E-R. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's and so you're, you, you have that tool. Show, um, show, show us that tool again. Okay, it's color mixing, how to get it right in five steps. Um, I believe I'm, I'm in the process of redoing the website. I believe it's on the website if you can't find it. I'm Lynn at lynnboyer.com and I can send you a PDF. Okay. So it, and uh, so you be careful. You might careful what you ask for. You might get a lot of people. Deborah Hughes had 700 people who, yeah. who uh, went to yeah. her website and got her free offer. So I think that's a good idea, by the way. Uh, would you email one of those to me, please? I would. Absolutely. Yes. All right. All right. Okay, um, what else you got? Okay. So I, I've got a million different, um, uh, Exercises I've done, I could go on and on, but you get the you get the gist. Ask a question, do a little research, work it out. It'll take you from um, just out there struggling to copy something to understanding relationships. It um, and so you can go from a copier to a creator. Yesterday, Scott, the wonderful Scott Galatly, um, was saying how he will interpret color. Um, He'll go out, and he's not just copying. He's actually painting an interpretation. He's creating something. So this kind of understanding is, in fact, if you have to go sometimes through the copying stage um, to learn, but then I think all of us want to be creators. So this will help. Um, let's see. What here's, else? here's a question for you. Right. Uh, it, it comes from Don Jones, who says, how do you get the soft edges on the local or mid-tone color? Oh, um, on, on the cylinders? I can't. I, I, okay, he, all right, yeah. How okay. do you get the soft edges on the local or mid-tone color? Okay, um, well, usually what I'll do is I don't like things super blended, so I'll, um, I'll mix another color, another value in between, and then uh, sometimes I'll just take, I'll lay it in loosely with a kind of fuzzy brush or something. Um, I like edges uh, rather than, sometimes in super realism, you'll uh, have some place where you want to really blend it and you'll use a soft brush where you'll actually blend. Or if you want to give the effect of blending where you're, if you get up close, it's not really blended, but if you get back, your eye will mix the colors. You can do that, and that you can do with like a, a more jaggy brush. I'm gonna look for an example for you. Um, let's see. Okay, a form, a rounded form, a rounded form. Um, oh, and also sometimes you don't want to um, necessarily over, over blend. Um, you, the, the charm of a painting um, can be that uh, the planes are, are very identified. Um, so then it, it's not, you know, soft and, and mushy. Um, this is a, a this car um, has a lot of rounded forms, but okay, you'll see so that, here, let me hold it still. Oops, okay. You'll see that 
though it has a lot of rounded forms, very few things are actually blended. Um, they're pretty much areas of value that then shift into another area of a close value. Um, and it gives a little bit more structure to your painting. Um, and if you would hold that back just a little while, just step back uh, because when, when you hold it backwards, just step back one more foot. Okay. See, it all comes together as round. It looks blended, but it's not. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right. And, it, and it does give... Um, is, that the, uh, is that the car you're doing the video of? Yeah, uh-huh. That's it. So preview, people. <laughs> We're going to do a video on that one on uh, painting cars and vehicles, which I'm excited about. Um, now, here's an example where something like a... Um, you know, a face is very rounded. You know, in other words, the, the forms flow into forms. But uh, even on this, if I can hold it up close enough, um, let's see if I can get this closer, get the computer. You'll see that there's still very specific. Can you see that, Eric? They're very specific. Yeah, just hold it still right there. All right. The planes are very specific, um, which gives it structure. And then again, as you suggested, if I step back, then it all comes together, but it doesn't look overworked, soft, or mushy. Um, and if you understand how to, um, if in doubt, uh, um, try leaving planes as flat shapes and turning the forms with other flat areas um, and and see what you can come up with. This one, which I'm going to do uh, from soup to nuts, I'm going to paint this for you um, soon in a video. I'm going to come back down to a wonderful studio in Texas. And if you can see how very specific those planes are, and Eric, here's, here's uh, what you were talking about. The terminator between um, the the shadow shapes and the light hitting the boys, I've put that line you were talking about in there between the two, and then it really works. Yeah, and then when I step back, it just looks like you know nice boys on a warm on a warm day. Yeah, so. I got wait 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 don't put it away yet. Now, turn it around, turn it turn over, it turn show me the back of the painting. Oh oh. Yeah, because I was curious. I noticed that you put your thumbnail yeah. sketch on the back. Do you do you traditionally yeah. do that? Um, no, I actually did it on this one, so I, I wouldn't lose it. I wouldn't forget to take it down when, when we're going to film the video. Oh, okay. um, but I, I usually just hang on to them. Um, some people actually uh, take them on the back, you know, as a little gift. I'm curious about your frames. I noticed that all the frames that you have showing are the same. They're black frames with a gold liner. Uh -huh. uh, do you is that pretty much what you've standardized on? And if so, why? Yeah, um, especially on the plein air circuit when you have to have frames. You don't know what you're going to paint, and you can't be flipping through flame frames trying to find something that looks good with that painting. I found that uh, a, a sort of um, espresso dark espresso brown frame and you see behind me same thing uh, Who is your, who's your frame supplier the gold rabbit um, it sort of depends at the time um, get a lot from uh, Randy uh, he uh, uh, king of frame Randy he be and he he at pace always brings tons of um, frames you can walk out with that are good ale. They're wonderful. So you're talking about kingofframe.com and that's Randy Higby. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, they're right. true. They've never failed me. We're, I'm trying to help everybody during this coronavirus. Anybody yeah. who we can mention and help them get some business, we should do it, right? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And like yeah, I by said, the way, somebody will put that in the comments in the website. I noticed they put John Asaro and plane of the head .com. So oh, you can put kingofframe.com right. okay. in there too. Let me just check and see if there are any questions in the uh, okay. in the uh, questions area before we wrap up. Um, okay. Yeah, she's some. Let's see. There's a lot of comments. Uh, a lot of comments about you being a great teacher. 
Um, it's hard. How do you, how do you not blend? Because if you're in the habit of blending, how do you get yourself out of the habit of blending? Oh, um, all right. I, you do. I have a saying, don't pet the kitty, you know, say it again. Don't pet the kitty. Don't, don't pet the kitty. Don't pet the kitty. In other words, you mix a color, you take a nice big stiff brush, you load it up, shovel that paint, you step up, lay that stroke down in the spot you want it to be for the purpose you, you know, why you want it there. And you step away, mix another color. In other words, you don't ever touch that stroke twice. Um, you might have to come back later and adjust something, but you'll find that if you keep doing that and you just keep building color shapes, you'll create the painting without having to blend. Also, the other thing is use, use giant brushes. You should pick up a brush when you're painting, you should pick up a brush that, that feels a little uncomfortable. And once you learn how to, um, handle brushes you can paint with really big brushes and and that'll uh really help you not getting in there and, and getting sort of fiddly and picky and and blending you know okay um, but uh, so uh, really that big oh yeah sometimes i paint with a brush this big in so fact, how, I'm how, how do you paint okay so you've got a character you've got a figure behind you it looks like yeah. a man in cuba from maybe from our trip oh. to cuba um, how do you paint a, something like that with such a big brush? I mean, you've got to have something smaller to get the detail. Oh, yes? Yeah, I am. Um, yes, I will use a variety of brushes, but I didn't, I didn't use a brush that big for this painting. Um, but I did use, and I only picked up, I'll show you about the size I would use on that. Um, uh, let's see, let me dig around here. I would have been using, I'll show you the brushes I would have been using. Um, maybe about like this, okay. Um, some of the big areas I would use, have used a bigger one. Um, what, oh, here it is. Uh, some of the background areas. I'll be laying in with, with a brush like this. I'll really be getting stuff in. Do some of it with a paper towel. Then I'll use a, uh, what's that, a 10 or 12. As long as I possibly can, and even be, if you learn how to use the edge and load it right, you can do almost everything you want with a great big brush. Um, in fact, I'm going to be teaching brush handling. Um, that's something I'm really excited about for the video we're going to do because it's sort of a, an overlooked area. Um, that can really uh, increase um, your knowledge of painting. So anyway, and then only I got the I'm gonna, I did bring out these little brushes, but I only pick these up. Let me get this again. Okay, I only pick these up at the very very end when I needed to um, maybe address. A, a tiny little stroke, a little hard to see, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I can't really get the light on it too well. A little tiny um, accent stroke between the fingers or um, something like that. Uh, just a little dot here or there. Um, okay, okay, Lynn, since we're running low on time here, yeah. um, get back, get back, get back. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, so what you got, what you got? What's that? My, my scrapey things. I'm going to tell you, teach you the magic of my scrapey things in the video. Okay. All right. Uh, will you do a quick show us your studio? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Let me, let me unplug this. Um, I'll show you something I did, uh, which is, okay. Looks like you've taken uh, display walls from your art shows and put yep. them up, is that right? Yeah, and that's so I can move them. They're easy to hang and my display lights. I'll do a painting, frame it, hang it, and live with it for a while to see if I like what's going on. So that's sort of my personal little display wall. It's also a sales wall. Um, and then I've got my easel here. 
That looks like a Todd Reifer's uh, uh, cabinet there. The um, yeah, mm -hmm. the yeah, love it. Totally love it. That comes from uh, Jerry's Artorama, I believe. Yep. Yep. Um, boy, that was a purchase I don't regret. It's so versatile, totally versatile and handy. Um, here's a here. Here, this is interesting. This is a piece I did when I was an illustrator uh, for Gore Vidal's book Lincoln. Wow. That's, yeah, that was the artwork for that. Wait, now, show that light. That that light there is a method light. That's a method light. I love my method light. And if you look back here, I have another mini one that I take on the road with me. I don't know if you can see it, that little black thing on a gooseneck yeah. that's pointed yeah. at the computer. That is the little travel method light, um, two essentials. And, uh, and does that become the light you use for your, uh, the light source you use in your painting room? Is that, is what? that is on or is that just for the video? Uh, sorry, I'm I'm trying to hold this stupid thing. What I use that for is um, I have the north light coming through the windows, but it'll sometimes sweep across a canvas, cooling off the left-hand side. And also the color of the light changes throughout the day. So I'll use the method lights to fill and even the color since you can adjust them through the spectrum. And yeah. also... Uh, how bright or not bright they are. So they're perfect. So I can get a really consistent light on what I'm painting uh, okay. throughout the time. What I did since I downsized my studio, so I didn't have to be paying for a big studio is I, I opened up the doorway. Uh, hi everybody. And um, so I blew out the door and opened up the space so that I can actually have a big painting on the easel and then walk back like 30 feet um, through the rest of, I gotta comb my hair, through the rest of the uh, house. And so, and I also, if I have a model or something or multiple models, I can use the dining areas. And so I can sort of morph my studio from small, small to big. Um, and here's, let's see, I don't know anything else. Uh, I shut the blinds so that I didn't get extraneous light. Um, so it's very, it's very functional and, and, you know, just a happy, happy place to be that you can see how I can expand my studio out into that area. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you for showing us. You're welcome. Yeah. It's always nice to see, um, see where people work and see what their environment is like. It's, it's lovely. And, uh, somebody asked about the banjo. Yep, Irish tenor banjo. I love it. It's so much fun to play. Okay. Uh, when you do the video, you're going to do some music on the video, aren't you? There's going to be music on the video, yes. In yes. fact, um, <laughs> since I am not as good as my musician friends, an um, uh, incredible musician named David Curley is going to be doing the music for the video. It's going to be really special. Actually, we've been working on it for a long time. So, um, and music and sound is going to have, um, is going to be a tool we're going to use in the video. Yeah. Well, you're such a great teacher and, and you really gave us a lot of good information today. I really appreciate it. Everybody give a thumbs up, a round of applause for Lynn Boyer. Outstanding. Thanks everybody. It was so fun to do. And I, I know you're, you're going to be heading to, uh, our soundstage in Austin soon to, to finish yeah. up that, that video and, uh, Again, we love having you on, on Plein Air Live. And so lynnboyer.com, uh, if you guys want the free um, color mixing guide that she's offering, at lynnboyer.com. And uh, Lynn, you're fabulous. Thank you so much for being so spontaneous and working with us and, and coming on the show.